Hi, welcome back everyone. My name is Daniel Goldstein. I'm one of the librarians here at UC Davis and it is now time for us to get back to our seats and settle in for our next panel, Sustaining Societies and Preserving Lost Cultures, Case Examples from India, Japan, China, and Vietnam Now and Then. It will be my pleasure to introduce the speakers to you, and it will be my duty to keep them on time. Um, as with previous panels, there may be time for a few questions after each speaker, but there will definitely be more time for questions after they've all presented, if, if I do my job correctly. So um, our first speaker, Dr. Deborati Sen, earned her doctorate in cultural anthropology and gender and women's studies at Rutgers University. She is currently associate professor of conflict management and anthropology at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. She has been deeply engaged in international research on a variety of topics for the past 15 years, focusing, as I understand it, primarily in South Asia. In 2017, she published her book, Everyday Sustainability, Gender, Justice, and Fair Trade in Darjeeling, Fair Trade Tea, excuse me, in Darjeeling with the State University of New York Press. This afternoon, she will be speaking on Farmpreneurs or Organic Tea Farmers, Entrepreneurialism, Resilience, and Sustainability in Darjeeling, India. Please welcome me in joining, or please join me in welcoming Professor Sen. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Hello and good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Uh, just want to make sure. Great. Uh, a couple of thank yous before I get started. Uh, I want to thank Catherine for inviting me uh, to this great event. Uh, I'm glad I'm connected to this wide uh, tea community now. Uh, it's, it's been great so far. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Elise Peterson. I don't know if she was here, but she connected me to Catherine. So I feel like tea is also part of community, and community is very important for social sustainability, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so um, uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll figure out uh, why I use the word fempreneurs. What has entrepreneurship got to do with producing organic tea in Darjeeling? So that's the kind of story. I'm an anthropologist, so um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to tell an interesting story. I know it's the afternoon, but hopefully you have had lots of tea to keep you awake. So, uh, uh, you know, anthropological research takes a lot of uh, support, financial and otherwise. So I wanted to thank uh, some of my um, uh, my sponsors over the last 15 years. Um, and uh, as, as Daniel uh, mentioned, uh, my, this is my book just came out uh, three months ago. And uh, it, it basically, the talk is a sort of a spin-off on a, a more on issues of entrepreneurship and survival of organic agriculture in Darjeeling. So uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'll first go through a couple of slides to kind of draw you into what I'm talking about and then read a small section and hopefully Daniel will tell me when it's too much uh, and I'll stop. So um, I want to focus on um, this particular concept that I worked with uh, in my book, which is called Gendered Projects of Value. I think it's important to ask ourselves what incentive uh, women have to produce and sustain the production of organic agriculture in India, uh, which is not s heavily supported by the state or their communities. In, uh, I mean, tea is a, very much a plantation crop. And what I'm going to be talking about today, are like the minority uh, peasant farmers or smallholder tea farmers who live in the margins of plantations. Whenever you hear about Darjeeling, the first thing that comes to mind is plantations. So I want you guys to uh, keep that in mind. So uh, my, uh, as a scholar, I've always been interested in the stories of women, especially in tea production, uh, because it's a very feminized um, sort of practice uh, or trade. Uh, not the 
sell or trade of it, but the production of it. So the three things that I, uh, I, I focus on, one is the gender dimension of alternative agriculture, and it become clear why that's important, and the relationship between farming and non-farming everyday practices uh, of trade is very important uh, to understand the sustenance of organic agriculture, at least in Darjeeling. The invisibility of certain uh, forms of gendered household and community level labor in on alternative agriculture is another thing I want to touch upon because uh, a lot of the labor of producing organics, so sort of the ex externalities of produ producing organics uh, is invisible and, and that's invisible labor. And, and although for us here, based uh, in, in the middle class, North American society, organics might be a no-brainer, a lot of the times women farmers in Darjeeling ask me, uh, why, why organic now? You know, what's the, what's the big deal? I mean, our lives haven't improved uh, to, a, to, to a great extent. So these are the kind of questions um, that have uh, you know, informed my, uh, my work over the last 15 years, and I want to, as, as, as especially when Catherine asked us to focus on the issue of sustainability and the future of tea, I want to draw your attention to this idea of social sustainability, which is always the weakest leg in, in discussions about global sustainability, because economic efficiency and environmental uh, efficiency or ecological efficiency, the triple bottom line approach, are much more measurable. Uh, whereas social sustainability, which is uh, on questions of empowerment, on questions of inequality, and if you know India is an extremely stratified society, the people I work with are basically um, migrants from Nepal who came across the border during the British rule to work in Darjeeling's plantations, and they became farmers quite by default. And I write on uh, the elaborate history of how they became farmers in the first place. So I think the question of uh, social sustainability becomes even more important because transnational initiatives like fair trade actually have gender-based audits to check for women's empowerment um, and social uh, capacity building. So I think it's very important that we reckon with how these systems of sustainability are playing out on the ground and how women understand them. So a typical... Um, a pack of organic sustainable tea, fair trade. So this is an equal exchange uh, pack. I don't know whether you can see it, but uh, this sort of uh, packaging, a uh, sold tea from this community of small farmers that I worked with in Darjeeling called Sanjukta Vikas, Sansa or SKS, as I say. And uh, usually they are sold under the Small Farmers Big Change Initiative. Um, and um, I, so now a little bit about how these communities came to become organic farmers. So as you know, uh, Darjeeling tea, like French wine, is uh, geographically indicated, which means that only plantation-produced tea in Darjeeling can be called Darjeeling. Everything else, even if it's of the same quality, can just be dust or, or dirt or whatever you have it. So, uh, but when the British left in the 1950s, what happened was um, a lot of the plantation owners sort of became squatters in their own land because uh, the change of ownership resulted in a lot of mismanagement. So these people, because of the acidic nature of soil uh, that tea produces, and especially the chemical-induced variety, uh, did not um, lend itself to any other form of agriculture. And Darjeeling Alder produces this really expensive brand of tea is extremely, um, the region itself is extremely poor. And there's a lot of male out migration. And so, you know, while people, as I said, people question why organic, is it really gonna improve them? So the question of social sustainability, their own sustainability uh, in connection with what they produce become very prime in everyday discussions. And here, uh, a gentleman who I met in 2003 is showing off his, uh, his, his new compost making skills but in his mind, he's really imagining uh, the yields like Green Revolution yields. Green Revolution was the agricultural revolution uh, in India in the 60s, right after independence. And so he expect that kind of uh, desire of prosperity is very much part of this agricultural imagination. 
So the ph farmers I work with, uh, they uh, struggle for years. They make something called uh, hate chia, which is basically hand rolled and home dried tea. And this is a very common practice in the households where these women, they basically, you know, the withering and rolling, which is done through machines in plantations, is essentially done by hand. So this is one of my uh, interlocutors. And it's very important uh, that because, um, um, you know, they, they do it, they, they sell now, they now sell their green tea to a local plantation. Uh, who, because they can't have processing factories, they're not wealthy enough, they're cooperative. They've come together to form a cooperative in the mid 90s, they, uh, they started the process with the help of a Jesuit NGO. And um, in the early 2000s, the cooperative came together and for the last 10 years, they have been receiving fair, they organic certified, uh, I think by IMO. And uh, they have uh, fair trade funds coming in but it, had, it has recently stopped, which is what I want to talk about in a short while. But they produce this kind of um, hand-rolled tea at home uh, for sale. And it can actually sell in quite uh, uh, a good price um, in, in their sort of contraband tea market in Darjeeling. And it's actually much, uh, it's interesting. The, the taste difference is quite interesting. It also has a slightly smoky flavor because it's produced as dried near the wooden uh, wood fires. So uh, it's interesting that the organic farmers outside of Darjeeling's plantations are actually called illegal farmers because they are outside the tea, uh, uh, tea um, uh, geographically indicated area. And the tea board is very, very, um, very worry of selling this tea or dealing with them. And also it helps plantations because whenever there's a shortage of uh, production uh, and, and the plantations started converting to organic in the mid 90s when the chemical residue uh, in that tea was found to be quite high. And with the loss of uh, secure markets of the ex-Soviet Union, they had to uh, devise new ways. So they, the region itself went through a lot of uh, turmoil. And <clears throat> what you see here, is a plantation landscape. This is what monoculture looks like. It's, this is a beautiful, our eyes are, uh, you know, we love to see this. And this is where, plant, this is plantation tree. And um, this doesn't look like anything. It looks like jungle, jungly, whatever, wild, uh, wild tea. Uh, you don't even know there's tea production. But there are areas like this all over Darjeeling, where, which are, you know, in, in the, uh, <clears throat> In, the, in, the, in between plantations, which have a lot of tea production. And uh, the area that I'm talking about is, uh, this is uh, this around here, sandwiched between Nepal, uh, Bhutan, so it's, a, it's called the chicken neck, and uh, Darjeeling. And uh, as I said, in the Darjeeling as a whole, out of the 87 plantations, about 30 to 35 of them have already gotten organic certification. And due to the conversion to organic, they sometimes the production falls. So that's when they go to these, car these uh, tea farmers and buy their green leaf, because then they can keep their production, net production at a high level, right? So there's a very interesting sort of uh, economy of tea production. This is a, and this is Tazo. <coughs> Starbucks has their own operation in Darjeeling. And, um, and a very bad one at that. <laughs> Uh, I'm not in Seattle, or so I feel okay. This is, uh, this is California. So, um, so and imagine the uh, monoculture-based uh, landscape that you saw before, and then look at this. Uh, this is sort of a typical multi-cropped um, uh, hill slope, and uh, you see the uh, the tea bushes are here. You can see, you know, this is in spring uh, when the tea is just coming out. These are the cardamom. Uh, no, sorry, these are, I think, yeah, I don't, can't remember the other ones. But anyway, ginger, cardamom, little bit of chili, pepper. Um, uh, they also grow oranges in the fall. So, they, they, so the people who were, who were sort of these tentative, precarious farmers uh, were actually discovered to be organic, their tea, because they couldn't afford all these uh, state-subsidized uh, state, uh, chemicals. So they became organic by default. 
They really complain about it sometimes because nobody wants to buy the other vegetables which are smaller when they take it to the market compared to others. So the lack of local market for organic products is also a big problem. And that's why the entrepreneurship is very important. So, um, so this cooperative now has uh, a lot of the work inside the cooperative is done by women because there's a lot of male out migration from, uh, from Darjeeling because of its economic backwardness. And so the actual farm work, supervision, et cetera, is done by women. And uh, through the cooperative, women have also been able to access microcredit loans through which they sometimes, uh, you know, they, they sell this sort of contraband hate, hand rolled tea uh, to return these loans because they can actually get good money through their own networks. So, you know, the, the survival of organic agriculture or organic tea production in these niches is really sustained by not just the actual task of producing the tea, but also these maneuvers that women uh, must do to make organic agriculture viable because they don't recognize the economies of scale and are dependent on plantations, and they, which only buys, they're happy to buy their green tea and let, leave them in the lurch. Uh, women who are literate uh, have also learned how to keep farm diaries and to go through the process of certification. You see a uh, general, the woman is disgusted because it's take, it takes out more time uh, from her daily routine. Also understand that unlike plantation workers uh, who are women who are very heavily stigmatized in the local uh, cultural uh, context, uh, women farmers are often they're, they take pride in staying at home and being housewives. That's also a mobility thing in the local culture, where you, women who stay at home are seen as more respectable. So this woman's disgust is thus contextualized. She doesn't want this. This causes conflict in her family, who think, why is she going away talking to all these men who are from NGOs and so on and so forth. So um, I talked about um, the simultaneity of trade and organic agriculture and women's maneuvers. Uh, business uh, ventures to sort of, uh, you know, keep it alive. I also talked about the invisible labor of organics and fair trade production in Darjeeling's tea sector. And so these small farmer women, the ones who are literate, a little vocal, they got involved um, in, uh, in, in informing their community about fair trade certification, organic production, on how not to make, because it's very hard to regulate you know, who's putting chemicals, and if, even if they find one or two people not using, using chemicals, the, the certification will be canceled, right? So a lot of these women did the yeoman's work of, because they were at home, they went to everybody's houses, held meetings like these to ensure that people are producing organic. So there's a huge labor of not just producing the tea, but also, you know, having this discourse circulate and, and be regulated, so the regulation work. And uh, because of the sort of uh, invisibility of their labor and the tussle over the premium price paid for organic and fair trade tea, uh, I just uphold this to give you a general, the picture quality is not very good, but here I call it the big fight because women cooperative members are questioning the president uh, in, on, on why they can't get an extra set of money from the fair trade premium for their own business ventures. So one of the things that women also do along with micro loans is they trade in various kinds of things. Like, you know, they'll buy stuff in town and bring it and sell it for a slightly higher price in the village. They'll make pickle or they'll make like woolen things, small knickknacks. So they, are, they, they keep thinking that, you know, that, that that's a big part of what supports, you know, them in the lean season because tea is only an eight month uh, yeah, an eight, uh, seven to eight month crop. So what happens next? And on top of that, you don't have a local market for other forms of organic products that they have in their home. So this, there's a lot of sort of resource-based tussle in the cooperative which goes unnoticed in these gender-based audits that come with organic certification too. In Darjeeling, organic and fair trade are two different kinds of certifications. But in Darjeeling, because of various reasons, they go together often. So uh, even older women have taken interest because it's the talk of the town that they're organic, the first organic far certified cooperative in Dajin. There are many other organic farmers who haven't gotten themselves this organized. There's a lot of meetings. They're listening intently. Now, 
The other thing that, uh, that is important to think about in, in what sustains organic agriculture is the aspiration of women. You know, a generation of women have involved themselves in organic agriculture, but you look at the little, excuse me, little girl who wants to go to office. She's playing as she wants to go to office. That's what she wants to do. So what will happen to the future? Future generations, will they produce tea? You know, men uh, find the cooperative an interesting place to, you know, sort of network with political parties and, and local state to get jobs. But what happens when people's aspirations are tied to also non-agricultural pursuits? So uh, that's kind of the whole context of um, uh, what, uh, to, to prep you for a little bit of reading. I'm an anthropologist, so I like to read a little bit. So I'll read out uh, a little bit uh, from uh, of some of my findings and then conclude uh, with that image. I called Binu in late March, this is late March of 2017, to see how everyone was doing in the cooperative. Uh, after updating me on their self-help group's Women's Day celebrations on March 8th, she added, quote, there is one bad news. Fair Trade Labeling Organization International or Fair Trade Funds have stopped coming without any reason, but the organic tea green leaf sales to the plantation which brokered this fair trade deal uh, is, is, is con continues, end quote. She implied that the plantation conglomerate that was in an informal uh, contract with the cooperative to buy green tea leaves and drop them off, uh, had dropped them from their fair trade op operations without any explanation. Small-scale organic tea producers in Darjeeling's out-of-the-way places living in the shadow trenches of big plantations often relied on these kinds of contracts with plantations to get their tea processed and marketed in the absence of their own processing factories. Cooperative, this, this kind of cooperative was also accessing fair trade money through, a, through the liaison with the plantation which dealt with equal exchange. The plantation had not kept up the fair trade end of the bargain while the cooperative continued to produce certified organic tea. This event should be seen in the context of other developments in Darjeeling's organic informal tea sector where the plantation conglomerate had periodically informed members of the cooperative that their tea was not selling very well in the West. This narrative corroborated with my own observations, the sudden disappearance of the uh, fair trade tea from their community which I tracked for the last seven or eight years in co-op stores and Whole Foods and places like that. Um, unlike previous fair trade and organic farming related setbacks though, uh, in the cooperative that had made women tea farmers very anxious because a lot of their household incomes for the seven months depended on the sale of green tea with the plantation and uh, community development projects happened with the fair trade money. This time there was a difference. Minu was not perturbed. She, uh, she was not sad that there, she was not sad because their Makbali SAG, which, which is the SAG they had formed by themselves, uh, w had dissociated themselves from the cooperative. So despite all this gender auditing, uh, women farmers, it, despite participating in giving tea to the cooperative and producing tea, completely dissociated their uh, business ventures from the dependence on the cooperative. They sold their family's green tea to the cooperative, but their everyday well-being now dependent, uh, now dependent on the SAG-based daily entrepreneurial ventures like selling the hand-rolled tea. The indifference was a turning point in understanding how alternative agriculture and its sustainability was interpreted by some of its beneficiaries in the global south. Why are women who are doing the work of producing organic tea and some of them rallied their communities at various points to support and maintain organic standards display such ambivalence towards something so drastic? Note that these women had in the past decade fought the male-dominated cooperative for fair trade funds as compensation for what they call, what I call the labor of organics. They had performed stories of empowerment in front of inspectors and still do as evident from interviews they forward me on WhatsApp all the time. Performative survival narratives are all over the internet. You can find people from there everywhere. What this, indeed, what this incident underscores is a, is, a, is a critical misrecognition at the heart of sustainability initiatives, an erasure of what I have called the gendered projects of value emergent in rural communities impacted by organic tea production. 
My objective, therefore, in this presentation was to sort of highlight how um, uh, women uh, organic farmers build resilience in their own communities by dual enactments of being organic farmers as well as entrepreneurs. The international development establishment is presently preoccupied with discussions of sustainability and resilience and social capital, trying to measure what the world's poor are doing in concrete ways to make life habitable under conditions of intense precarity. The discussion of resilience dovetails quite well with the celebratory narratives of market-based development, uh, which desire to tap into women's everyday creativity and embolden such efforts. These intersecting enactments are at the core of social practices and associated processes of social and cultural production that actually sustain marginalized communities in the face of whimsical uh, fair trade, which drag, which, uh, which drag and drop them in, in the partnership of global solidarity. Therefore, no one finds out why SKS was suddenly dropped from the Equal Exchange Network. What transpired between the Indian tea, tea, tea conglomerate and equal exchange? As India declared some of its own federal states as organic, uh, how am I doing? Good. Okay, great. How much time do I have? Oh my goodness, okay. So I guess to understand what sustains uh, agriculture, we must explore the intersections of organic farming practices with emerging forms of gendered entrepreneurialism in organic farming communities. And, this, and, and I especially make this case for India where organic production might be a very hype thing, but it's not, a, it's not a new thing. Women provide the necessary labor of sustaining organics that should ideally come from the state or the international trading partners. Note that when co cooperatives go through certification, they have to uh, you know, bring, pay the fees, which is very expensive from time to time. I contend that the success of organic farming depends on these critical maneuvers that both entail economic and cultural entrepreneurialism and demonstrate forms of resilience expressed in these gender projects of value, these desires of trading uh, so that they can sustain themselves. Um, and um, over the last 11 years, every time I, saw, I see a neon lit billboard in a US airport with smiling faces of women farmers or refugees posing with their pretty fair trade certified handicrafts or food products um, or fair trade publicity materials celebrate, celebrated in, and survival narratives of women beneficiaries, the voices of women farmers from Darjeeling's out of the way places reverberated in me. Their rebuke of development. They often say, why is the fair trade money coming back? There must have been an overflow in the, in the West. So they don't understand it because the structures of domination are so, uh, you know, with the North-South divide is felt so strongly in these quarters that they don't understand the question of partnership. They see it as a hierarchical arrangement. So they say, oh yeah, the overflow has stopped. Maybe they say, spent too much money, they don't want to buy our tea, right? So their rebuke of development, their anger, their excitement about new business plans, and the sharp humor with which they joke about all their own initiatives uh, or their business, they use the word in, in organic farming, has filled me with cynicism and hope at the same time. Cynicism comes from witnessing the hubris of social justice as it plays out in the global stage of activism with distinct local manifestations and material effects, oblivious to women's situated histories, entrepreneurialisms, and everyday realities. Hope, because this 15 years uh, of ethnographic work in Darjeeling has convinced me that no development policy is able to sap poor women's creative agricultural potential, their everyday innovations that keeps them grounded in, an, in a kind of everyday street feminism, deeply worry of the agents of the aid or academic world. And they actually questioned me, why do you come back? What do you get out of this? So you know, why are you here? Of course we like you, that's okay. Um, so, uh, and, I ex and I end with the last, uh, last uh, 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 section. Uh, in the middle of 2015, I learned that some of the women in SKS had formed a new self-help group called Makmali, which was completely independent of the cooperative or any NGO help. They were uh, women farmers pooled together their own personal savings and made small items for consumption like knitwear, pickles, snacks, in, in addition to selling a huge quantity of this kind of hand-rolled tea in the villages. 
The business was running well for about uh, these 12 women, and they were actually now planning to scale up uh, and, uh, and basically approach the local bank for savings. I asked one of uh, Binu, one of the lead players, uh, why in the name Makhmali? What does it, why did they, why are there so many names that they could choose from their Nepali uh, language? Why this? She quickly grabbed my hand and took me outside her house, pointing at the bushes of purple flowers called Makhmali. Uh, they looked very fragile, but endured the harshness of winter, bringing color and charm to the all gray all around. The emphasis in Binu's explanation was on the beauty, endurance, and survival. She added, and I quote, we could not find a more befitting name. It's like our ambitions and work, which survived the dictates of the cooperative men, end quote. Thus, gendered projects of value took many turns in the tea farming villages in the last decade, sometimes trying to engage with organics in a meaningful way, teaching about fair trade to communities, sometimes avoiding it and, uh, like forming se separate groups, but never losing sight of what was possible for them, their everyday sustainability. Thus, they are seasoned fempreneurs. And I call them fempreneurs because in India, in the urban sector, a lot of these sort of middle class women take great pride in saying, okay, you know, we uh, sell stocks, so we are fempreneurs, we are moms, so we are mompreneurs. And we never think about uh, rural women. You know, they, they are one of the most savviest uh, people. They're trading all the time. You give them something, it's, oh, you're throwing it, give it to me, I'm going to sell. I take a lot of Ziploc bags because in Darjeeling it rains a lot. So they told me, and it's very expensive to buy Ziploc bags in India. You know, we might think it's like a, the cheapest thing we get in our local dollar store or something, and they sell it. So their understanding this of what's sustainable, of course, is not without blind spots, just like our engagements in social justice that are grounded in our lifestyles and political choices. I want to refrain from all possible essentialisms in proposing something uh, the, you know, in propounding something like an eco-feminist perspective that all solutions lie in the grassroots, uh, which are deeply problematic. They're, these women are not intrinsically drawn to organic agriculture. They are not craftsmen. For, uh, for, I, I would, I would it be, behoove me to sell um, them as such. Yet, it is at the grassroots that one witnesses the drama of gender and sustainable development unfold in its excesses. This is where one witnesses uh, the characteristic scrutiny of the good in commodified organic agriculture. Thank you.